if you want to play music, play music with your friends. Like there, there used to be, you know, the people that wanted to make it big in the music biz would put ads in the back of a music magazine or a local magazine like The Rocket, like, you know, seek, you know, vocalist seeking, you know, guitar player and drummer, you know, and so many of them would be like, must have pro looking attitude, you know, no losers, you know, like blah, 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 like, you know, must have a car. <laughs> and uh, most of them didn't make it anywhere because uh, they're just trying to build this perfect band. But music is so much about connecting with the people that you're playing with. And if you're already buddies, then you've got, you're halfway there in my mind, as far as uh, finding some way to communicate with each other. And uh, that's kind of what playing music together is, right? And so, even that transcends music, right? That could yeah. be true with any creative yeah. act. This is Yeah, yeah, I, I would think. And uh, to me, I maybe I got lucky. Uh, you know, my friends were, you know, as inept as I was when we started playing in bands. And, you know, you just kind of grow together. Mr. Steve Turner, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. Happy to be here. Uh, for the handful of people who uh, maybe are not quite as aged as I am and grew up with grunge in the background uh, as a soundtrack to my youth, I'm wondering if you can begin by sharing with us a little bit about who you are uh, and, a, and a little bit of background so we can uh, help orient our listeners and watchers in time and space. Tell us who you are. Sure. Uh, well, I'm Steve Turner. I've been playing guitar in the band Mud Honey for over 35 years now. That's a Seattle-based band, but I happen to live in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can say that out loud if you're, if you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started, you know, going to punk rock shows in 1980 as a 15-year-old, started playing guitar, um, and started playing in bands by 83, most of which have been with uh, Mark Arm, the singer of the main bands I've been in, I guess, uh, Green River, Mud Honey, and Monkey Wrench. So for the people who are not grunge aficionados, these are like probably three of the most seminal sort of iconic bands that led the grunge charge there. It's, it's fair to say that others like Pearl Jam and Nirvana um, have probably sold more records and maybe more, <laughs> yes. more, more widely known. <laughs> but if you talk to any of the members of that band and Stone, a mutual friend of ours, Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam, wrote the forward to your new book. Uh, and, you know, obviously um, Kurt is well known, but those folks cite you and Mark and other folks in Mud Honey as their influences. They looked up to you. And so as someone who, then if you just do the math, arguably we're seminal in, you know, kicking off this universe of music that not dissimilar to the Beatles changed the sound of all of the music on the radio. You know, does that change how you put your pants on every day? Do you walk around with the puffed up chest or like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very, it's, it's not an overstatement to say that, you know, the work that you put out there in the world changed music. And yet you probably didn't, you know, grow up with that as your ambition, or maybe you did. I'm hoping you can tell us. Um, it, you know, to me, the Seattle scene and where it came from was a small group of people that were playing in bands by 84, a lot of us, you know, that went on to being in much bigger bands. So I don't, I don't take any credit for anything. Um, uh, I think it was it was a, a, a group effort, if you will. <laughs> it was an isolated, smaller city that did, a lot of touring bands didn't go to, and we created our own scene in the in the mid '80s, essentially. And it got noticed, and some of the bands became huge, like obviously the ones you've mentioned. But you know, can't not mention Soundgarden since they were around in 1985 as well. Um, right, shout out. They were early on, and you know, Malfunction, Ten Minute Warning. There were so many bands, human, that were doing amazing stuff in 1985 that, you know, we kind of stepped on their shoulders as well. But tell me, did you set out? Was that part of your ambition to, like, have the impact that you did? Or were you just focused on the craft and the world grabbed on to what it is that you guys were working on? I mean, you know, how I'm trying to get into the mindset of 
the 18, my mindset 18 was, year old world. 18 yeah, my, me as an 18 year old, uh, I didn't think anything was going to come of the music thing. It was just something that me and my friends did for, for fun and something to do on the evenings and weekends. Um, you know, I famously thought that Stone and Jeff Ament were deluded for thinking they were going to make a living, let alone be stars in music. I, I thought, I was like, I couldn't even comprehend that idea. Um, they obviously proved me quite wrong <laughs> through the decades. But yeah, it wasn't, wasn't part of my deal. You know, I, I liked, I, I guess I was playing in punk bands and uh, I'd go back to college. Did you feel like this? So I'm fascinated by punk. I grew up on Black Flag and, you know, other early punk um, sex pistols, stuff like that. And and part of my understanding and what I lived also skateboard culture, you know, we would like build skate ramps and then, you know, skate them and skating was an expression. The building of the ramp was actually a very creative act. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the music that went along with that culture, it was all very, you know, it was all very sort of handmade and gritty. And, um, I, you know, the term is pretty, was probably best encapsulated by DIY. Mm -hmm. You know, how much of that do you feel like was important to what it, what it was you created? And then importantly, what do you feel like if you were going to give some advice you know, to people, are you still seeing that as seminal or critical for the creative, you know, community at large? So, you know, how important was it then? And if you're going to give some advice, is that still a thing that you feel like is good, better, not as good as, as uh, the time that you, when, when you were uh, in that part of the process? Well, for me as a kid, skateboarding was huge. Um, I was a total, you know, half pipe vert skater and that's how i got into music in the first place was through skateboarding um because some of the pros got into punk rock and then we all kind of had to follow suit um yeah I, I think it's still very uh you know skateboarding is such a wide umbrella at this point it's a sport it's an olympic sport but there's still that diy culture you know ingrained in it um especially here in the northwest yeah uh, all the skate or a lot of the skate park builders are based here and in Seattle and there's still DIY spots going up all the time in Seattle. You have marginal way um, using a big example. And in Portland, obviously you have Burnside under the bridge. Um, and music has always gone hand in hand with that. And it's all expression. Um, Specifically, what do you think that, you know, is there something to learn from that? And, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to find out, if you're going to give some advice is, you know, do, do we need to be more DIY or, or by contrast has DIY just exploded because now, you know, not only can the kid make their own punk, punk rock and by kids, I mean, all of us, right. Can we make <laughs> our own music? Can we make the videos? Can we shoot the still pictures? Can we record our albums, put it out on, you know, our, you know, music platform, insert music platform of our choice, yeah. you know, create video is, do you feel like that, that it is different, better, worse off now than it was, you know, when, when you guys came up? Well, there wasn't any of that high tech stuff when we were kids, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so it was just, you know, finding a hall to put on a show and, and that sort of thing. You know, it was, it was a community thing where you got together with people, um, that's diminished a little bit, I think, for the younger generations. And I can speak, you know, to that. I've got an 18 year old and a 23 year old sons. Um, and honestly, the last few years, the pandemic didn't help. Yeah. You know, young people getting together much. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the avenues to create your own music and art and get it online and get it seen on all the different platforms. I think that's great. Um, I still like the real world a little bit more, you know, yeah. <laughs> I like going to see shows and uh, things like that still. Um, I, you know, a lot of people still do, uh, having just been on tour, I'm surprised that the crowds are still as big as they are um, after those two years of hell. <laughs> so speaking of, it's reasonable to share that uh, you all and Mud Honey. Uh, I've just celebrated your 35th anniversary. Uh -huh. um, 
where a lot of these other bands have already hit their peak and maybe even, you know, um, I don't know, dissolved over time, but you guys have new, new record out plastic eternity. Yeah. Uh, what is it like to keep, you know, will you continue to make music? Why keep going or why never stop? I mean, what's, what's the, <laughs> you know, not a lot of folks that are, you know, that have had the success that, that you all have had um, are still making music. A lot of people are sitting back and collecting checks. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of check collecting in our world, for one. Um, we still like making music, ultimately. Uh, we don't do it all the time. It's not our job. We've all had jobs and other careers through the years, um, which I think helps keeping it a little bit in check. Yeah. Um, you know, we, I, I think this last record was made under slightly different circumstances because we hadn't seen each other for a year and a half, and we kind of had a – we were uh, – under a deadline <laughs> that we had to like get a record done if we wanted to do the other things that we were kind of hoping to plan to do. And uh, so, you know, we got fairly creative in the studio, made things up, which normally we don't do. Normally we have things fairly worked out before we go in the studio. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that luxury this time, which I think helped, you know, have the creative juices flowing and overdrive a little bit while we were in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you kind of need to have a, a hook to go on tour. Bands our size, we make money on the road. That's really the only place. I mean, occasionally you get something, you know, if you license a song somewhere or something like that. But for the most part, it's it's live that we make money. And uh, it really helps to have a record <laughs> to when before you go on tour so you can get more press sure. to promote the tour. <laughs> sure, sure. How much of that, I mean... So if you make you're making music now, not necessarily for the money, but specifically because you love it, and how much of going on tour feels like joy? That's what music was designed. You know, it's, I, I heard an interesting quote that has stuck with me, and I'm gonna botch it up, but it's sort of like it's sort of like looking or listening to music, even through headphones, just listening to it rather than being at the place it's performed is akin to looking at a photograph of a flower rather than experiencing the flower in real life, right? There's so much more when you're yeah. actually with the flower and by extension, so much more when you're actually in the room. So how much of, you know, being on tour is trying to fund the passion and how much of it is just something that you cannot replicate anywhere else in the world well two points to that i guess or three or four um i think recorded music is very a very different art form than playing live i, I think it's a it's a much different you know you're creating something that can be heard forever essentially mm -hmm. uh, and you know obviously when you're in the studio you're adding extra things to the songs and you have time to work things out and um, you know, I love listening to records, you know, I have a room full of them. Uh, and to me, that's a different thing than live. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a live record is the same, is kind of diminished from actually seeing that performance live, you know, uh, but I, I think the recording aspect of music is a, a great, fully functional uh, thing. You know, I, lo I love listening to weird records. Um, but uh Going on tour, it's a big part of being a musician, I think, playing live. And it's, you know, sometimes it's by the skin of your teeth, you're getting through a song and that's kind of fun. Um, touring is also somewhat exhausting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't get a lot of sleep. Um, you got many days in a row without a break, long drives, you know. Um, it's kind of like people say it's like 23 hours of sitting around and one hour of, of having a good time. Um, but that's a really good time. So it's worth it. <laughs> it makes it, it evens out in the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, you have obviously seen so much transformation in the music industry. I'll say the creative industry. Um, some of that is, you know, for the worse in many ways. Uh, and some of it's for better. I'm wondering if you can comment on what do you think is working for the future of creativity and creatives everywhere, whether you're a musician, designer, 
entrepreneur, photographer, filmmaker, whatever, like what's, what's Steve Turner's take on the future of creativity? How, what makes it unique and special and different and better, harder, worse? Like it's changing. Give, yeah, me, your hot, like, give me your hot take. My hot take is it's all about the technologies that allow you different freedoms to get things done in different and new ways, which is, you know, evolution, I guess, of, of different arts. I mean, I'm sure, you know, photography has changed so much. Radical. Yeah. yeah. Radical. And it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm no photographer, but just watching that evolve through the decades with, you know, I've got good friends that are photographers, of course, and uh, watching how they deal with it and, you know, some of the high tech cameras and, and what those cameras can do, it's kind of breathtaking. Um, so I, th I think it's just a technology that is evolving that helps a lot of these creative arts move forward. And I, I don't think it's binding anything, you know, um, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it to me. It seems like it's just more freedom and more, it might be more crap out there because of it. <laughs> it's easy <laughs> to get it out there. <laughs> yeah, because the but bar like, is so low to create it and distribute it. Yeah, yeah. Like it was kind of like in the 1990s that the, you know, indie rock explosion, every band put out a seven inch record, you know, so there's a, there's, I don't, even, I don't even know how to judge and guess how many there were, but every indie band that could muster up a couple hundred dollars made a seven inch. <laughs> so, which is kind of also exciting because that's sort of what happened in the sixties with the garage bands as well. People just haven't really sorted out, you know, the, the good from the bad of the 90s stuff yet you know they're still working on it <laughs> but yeah so i that that was a big change in a way you know and then the you know the cdr revolution for there's certain bands that you know discogs.com which is a uh, where you can buy music uh, um, records and cds and whatnot and uh it's like guess a big marketplace like ebay yeah but um some bands you know i'll have to look up because i deal records that's one of my other side hustles and some bands they'll have you know 400 cdrs available you know that they everything they've ever recorded you can actually buy one if you want <laughs> you know and that that's pretty wild you know like how can uh, you play a cdr though <laughs> like, I, I i don't know you know at this point <laughs> they might not work anymore you know? <laughs> but, i mean i still have my computer so old i still have a cd player in my computer here my laptop wow wow <laughs> that's impressive yeah. It will even do whatever we're doing right now, recording. This I know. Podcast. I wasn't. I wasn't sure it was going to. <laughs> a, a, what is it? A Dell twenty one hundred? No, it's a MacBook <laughs> Pro from I don't know twenty ten or something. Oh, nice! Yeah. It still has a disc player. Yeah. So, I guess there's a little bit of this, which is sort of nostalgic. Like we love, you know, old technology. It's gritty. Everything old is new again. It's like there's been a huge resurgence in '90s music. If you look at you know, a 16 year old, they are dressing in the same way that you and I dressed in 1991. <laughs> and, you know, I, this is not new for anyone listening, right? These styles, they are cyclical. Yeah. Does that, does that, has that made you feel uh, more connected to the music when you s listen to it and it's on the radio again and people are, you know, resurgence in, 90s bands and you know whether that translates to record sales is not my point here it's mostly sort of cultural and, and and a feeling is that a you know are you aware of that does that occupy your brain space at all that that you know that 17 year olds are way into your music and way into 90s music and 90s fashion again or is that just is that not on your radar at all that's, that's not much on my radar you know i see it with kids and and stuff like i said i have an 18 year old son so I see his his world. Um, you know, I for me, I listen to just weird records I find. I still go to thrift stores and dig through records. I mean, it's getting harder now because vinyl got too popular. It's kind of mm. priced me out of it in some ways. But <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I just like digging weird music from the past. So I am starting to reacquaint myself with the 90s because I kind of ignored that whole thing when it was happening. I I got really into the, the 90s, had a great garage rock scene that was happening with labels like Estrus up in Bellingham and, and uh, stuff like that. And, you know, I still go back and dig through that stuff and find more interesting things that happened in the 90s that I 
had ignored somehow and now they're finally getting through <laughs> i'm sure that uh speaking of the 90s let's go back in time for a second and you know i i it's time for me to give a shout out to your book called mud ride um which is i don't know it's sort of autobiographical autobiographical but it's also like historical documentary and there's a bunch of really interesting photos uh but it's chock full of stories um that are humorous heartfelt relatable and i'm wondering if you have a a favorite that might be um i don't know something that people didn't know talk to us like do you have a do you have a fave story from the book that uh is about yeah. maybe again we're the goal here is not to talk trash but about someone who may or may not be a living legend that that uh you'd like to air out here on the air <laughs> um yeah i mean i you know my goal was not to talk trash on anybody in the book you know um <laughs> that, that was the goal but i mean there's the i don't know if you're thinking of the the Jeff McKagan getting on stage with us. Was, was a <laughs> Maybe. Fun one. Maybe. That, that was that was a good one. That was uh I mean Duff is a total hero of mine first off. He's uh, a rad guy. I've read his books. Uh smart, you know, down to earth, hard working, and he was in some amazing bands in the early 80s that I saw. Guns and, and Roses. Well, this that that's later. That you know, he was he did plenty before that. He was in half the bands in Seattle as far as punk bands went. But uh you know, he also got out of Dodge and moved to L.A. And, uh, you know, getting there, I will say that we saw, I think, the second Guns N' Roses show ever. They came up to Seattle and uh, opened for the Fastbacks. And they were not good. <laughs> I remember, like, going, like, geez, man, Duff left Seattle and all his cool bands for this. <laughs> but they got their act together pretty quick, <laughs> to be fair. And that, I, I like that first Guns N' Roses record a lot. Um, but... During the heyday in the early 90s, when he was still drinking heavily, he came to one uh, Mud Honey show in, in Hollywood and was, you know, liquored up. We all were, I'm sure. But uh, we were doing, as an encore song, we were doing a song with Black Flag singer uh, Keith Morris and Des Kadena. Both of them were there. And uh, um, he wanted to get on stage and play with us as well. So we're like, sure, just put Mark's guitar on and have at it. And, uh, you know, he stumbled out there and we were doing Fix Me, which is a, about a minute long. He stumbled out there, asked Lucan what key the song was in. Lucan just says, what's a key? And then the song starts and he's still just fumbling with the guitar. And by the time, like, the song was done, he'd finally, I think, got the guitar working. <laughs> <laughs> and then we stumbled back off the stage. <laughs> and did the, was the crowd any wiser? I don't know, actually. <laughs> I, I, you know, it was it, it was kind of a blur for me too, you know. But it's a fast song. I think I was just staring at Des and Keith because I was like my two of my all time heroes. <laughs> but they're singing together on stage, uh, old Black Flag song with us. I was kind of enamored by that. <laughs> yeah, part of the um, the what I'll call the grunge scene, but I think maybe just music in general, and certainly punk rock, was there was this there was a huge community vibe. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm wondering if you can speak to that, like, cause that can still be very, very true today. I feel like creative communities are better than, you know, individuals, individuals can make art within those communities, but it's this community of supporting one another, you know, it, in your world, that might be, you know, going to their shows where there's only 42 people, mm -hmm have showed up but that showing up actually matters for your peers and friends and co-conspirators and collaborators i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role that community played in you know in mud honey's success in just the success of those music genres and how how ought creators today ought to think about community in their worlds yeah well you know for for us punk kids in the early 80s I mean, I can't speak to the 70s because I started literally like at the dawn of 1980 was I started listening to punk rock, I think. But uh, um, it was about writing letters. To, like you, you, you'd get a, you know, a couple years later, you'd have uh, Maximum Rock and Roll fanzine and Flipside fanzine. And in the back, there were little ads for, you know, demo tapes and things like that. And you'd just 
write people in different cities and ask how things were going there. <laughs> you know, like, like I did that a lot. Just send off a, you know, stamped envelope to JFA in Arizona because they were skaters and playing hardcore. So I was like, hey, what's it like down there, man? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so that, that was a big part of it and fanzines and just staying in touch with at all the, the different scenes the best way we could because again, the technology was limited. Um, and that also, you know, went into like creating the early touring that, you know, bands like Black Flag and DOA and Dead Kennedys and some of the Midwest bands that started venturing out kind of created this underground network of venues. Sometimes the venues were people's houses or a Grange Hall somewhere that you could rent for shows. Uh, so it was, it was a very, I mean, like back to DIY again, it was very DIY, that scene, but that kept everybody in contact with each other and kind of created this like national, if not international network. Um, in Seattle, on a microcosm of that, the shows were so small that it, it really was the same 50 to 100 people. And half of those people were in bands and those bands broke up and reformed in different units with you know the slightly different lineups and things like that and we'd sit around and argue about music and you, you know uh critique each other's bands if you will <laughs> you know and you just talk about that stuff at parties after the shows and you know it was a small close-knit community and uh you know i think that's what made it you know kind of stand out because we really didn't get a lot of shows we were lucky to have a really good all ages venue for a while called the metropolis in 83 84 and that really helped coalesce things um it made touring bands show up suddenly all the california punk bands had a place they could play um quite some really obscure ones would just drive up from san francisco and stuff and that was amazing to see things like tales of terror and rebel truth you know playing in front of the same 100 people <laughs> um so, you know, for this day and age, I think it's easy to stay in touch, but you can kind of, I mean, Instagram and those kinds of things. Um, I feel I keep in touch with a lot of my group through Facebook and Instagram for sure. And I don't know if that's of less value than doing things in person, but it's a, kind of the same thing. I can keep in touch with all these international friends I've had for 30 years and um, see what they're up to. How and about also, the relation? How about the relationship with fans? Do you think that's transformed with uh, technology? You know that you're like messaging fans, and you know fans can find yeah. out. You know all they get to see what it's like. You know when you're in the music in the in the studio recording. You know relative to in the '90s when that you know there was no such thing really as behind the scenes right. videos. You had the shiny packaged <laughs> label released album, and that was pretty much you know, that was it. That's all you saw was the, that, and that's why live shows were so, you know, basically the centerpiece of everything. Well, I think, you know, I, I'm on both Facebook and Instagram. I let anyone that wants to follow me can follow me. Um, and so there's a lot of fans that do that, of course. Sure. And I think, you know, we're not great at social media posting. Sure. You know, we do some, uh, we have other people that run the Mud Honey Facebook and Instagrams. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, because because none of us were that inclined to get it done. Uh, but, you know, I think that's kind of a neat thing that fans can follow artists fairly closely and see fairly. I mean, they see me post a picture of me and my girlfriend and then suddenly they're following my girlfriend, too. <laughs> my girlfriend <laughs> sometimes like, uh. <laughs> thanks. 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 But no, thanks. Yeah, so I think she's a little bit more careful than I am. Yeah, you know, I guess let anybody, you know, follow. <laughs> but I think that's fun. I, I mean, I follow artists I I admire, I, and you know, it's kind of fun a little peek into what they're up to if they're actually organized enough to post regularly. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think made? I'll say grunge, with sort of air quotes around it, because you can really talk about that whole universe of music there's all kinds of yeah. offshoots and you know if you're a music head then you could slice and dice this but what what made it 
successful? Was it timing? Was it the sound? Was it the community, the ethos? The like, why that? Uh, I think there were some really uh, strong bands, first off. Uh, if we use the two bands that went astronomical first, you had Nirvana followed by Pearl Jam. Um, they both have incredible charismatic frontmen. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a feeling of kind of not danger necessarily, but uh, it was a little bit unhinged and not controlled by the man very mm -hmm. much. Like uh, the music industry was really taken aback when it happened. Uh, they didn't know why it like hit that hard, but I think Nirvana, that Opening salvo, the Smells Like Teen Spirit was an amazing song and the video was great. And it, you know, the, I think the younger generation was already getting tired of the more sanitized pop music that had been happening. And it was just like kind of the last time that the kids spoke without being told what to listen to. Uh, the music industry got control of, of the whole thing pretty dang quick. You know, like two years later, it seemed like they were back under control. I mean, a band like Mud Honey, we benefited from that whole uh, confusion, if you will, within the music industry, where the execs had no idea why it was popular. They were so they were suddenly hiring, you know, kids to be A and R people. <laughs> like, go find us something the kids like, because we don't understand this stuff. <laughs> and so we ended up on Warner Brothers reprise because of that. Uh, I think our A and R guy, David Katz Nelson, was the youngest A and R guy <laughs> at Warner Brothers. <laughs> younger than you guys probably <laughs> yeah well, much younger yeah yeah but he was awesome he's still a great friend of ours uh so we benefited from that we had the freedom to do what we wanted while on a major label until we didn't and then we got dropped because <laughs> we weren't going to sell a million records and that was obvious from the get-go to us but <laughs> well I, I think that's a interesting thread to pull on if you don't mind going there for a second like what is there any internally, you know, as you're sitting around with Mark and your other bandmates across the, the myriad of bands, is there some, I mean, you had Stone, right? You're, you're the forward to your book. Again, we're talking about Mud Ride, a messy trip through grunge explosion. Um, so is there, what was, was there any tension between the bands that sort of you know, sold tens of millions of records and the ones that sold tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of records. And it, it's clearly, there's a community that we just talked about, right? There's yeah. a creative connection a collaboration and everyone was showing up for one another. But I wonder if there's, was there any sort of riff between uh, the bands that made it on a global scale and those that didn't? I can only speak for myself and mud honey collectively i guess i i can speak we had no feelings of uh contempt or or jealousy or anything like that we are when it, when nirvana hit big we the joke was always like nirvana sh should be number one in a perfect world they'd be number one man because about a girl was such a great song on the first record but uh when they hit number one we were first off it wasn't yet a perfect world but uh we were just happy for them and excited. And then, you know, Pearl Jam exploded and that was awesome. Uh, Soundgarden was already kind of building their thing. Uh, they were kind of, they were kind of growing separately in a, in a way, because they were being before, like in the pre-grunge, like when they were first on their major label, they were being marketed as a metal band. Cause yeah. that was really the only option for a hard sounding band like that. And, loud, uh, lo loud love that album. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they were touring with on the more metal side of the fence, if you will. And uh, but they quickly got incorporated into it, too, as, as did Alice in Chains. And, you know, that was just an exciting. It was great. I, I was happy for everybody. We're really close to a lot of people in these bands, you know, and um, we were doing just fine. You know, we we started touring in 1988. And we got to a certain level of success way quicker than I would have ever imagined. And we were touring Europe and, you know, having a great time and paying our bills with it. So um, I didn't want to be that mega rock star. That was never a dream of mine as a kid. And once it got just ridiculous by 92, 93, 
I was just so happy I wasn't just seeing how uh, Ed Vedder was almost a prisoner in his house at times, <laughs> you know, because of like stalkers and just the people that he, I could still go to the grocery store. I guess I always use that as an example. I was, yeah. I was glad I could still go to the grocery store. Yeah. I'm, I'm, there's a page in the book here that I'm paying attention to, which is, uh, let's see. It put us in the unique position of experiencing both the underground world of our own making, as well as the major label machinations of some of our good friends were going through mud honey. We're selling tens of thousands of albums, not bad for the underground while we were touring arenas with Nirvana and Pearl Jam, who had already sold millions of albums. We led an oddly charmed life in many ways. We got to see how the other half lived without having to deal with the downside. Exactly. Eddie, Eddie Vedder couldn't go to the grocery store, but I could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, I liked having my freedom. But I, you know, I, there's a certain, you know, I don't mind getting recognized out and about and you know that happens on occasion um i don't know how stone does it stone barely ever gets recognized <laughs> well, he's always got hat and glasses and yeah but it, it's just... weird it, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of unique i'm like I don't know no one ever notices this guy <laughs> he, he rolls pretty incognito so does, does. Yeah. so does eddie the times that i've been with him he's like always got you know big glasses and a hat and a yeah roll and low profile so uh, you shared the story of uh, Duff getting on stage with you guys, and this. Or I, I'm going to share a story. So we, um, a good friend and I, used to produce these evenings where we would uh, get together, amazing food, amazing chef friends of ours, and amazing musician friends of ours, and we would, you know, maybe invite usually about 25 musicians usually from a couple different bands um and one of these nights it was the hottest night in the history of seattle prior to the last couple of years where we had a couple of days in the 107 or eight or whatever i think it was 101 yeah. degrees or 102 degrees and we had occupied the penthouse of the sorrento hotel and had one of these dinners where we recorded this music and and subsequently shared it with the world and these were acoustic evenings um and again folks like from from pearl jam and the dandy warhols and some very very amazing bands and some up-and-comers and, and we we curated different groups of musicians sometimes we had a hip-hop one or we had a grunge one or whatever and one evening in particular that i remember this night at sorrento um it was an acoustic set and I remember the day of, you know, this was, it takes a lot of production to do these things. We had, you know, yeah, six yeah. or eight cameras and sound technicians and chefs, and we try and make it look like nothing's happening behind the scenes, but you know, everyone's pulling their hair out and the co-host, my, Michael, my co-host and I were getting, you know, get to be at the table with y'all and, and introduce these acts. And, and I remember we had to, at, at some point, I think the day before you guys had said, you know what? we're we're not going to play acoustic we're pl we're going to be fully plugged in and we're like <laughs> well shit it's going to be at like you know 10 30 at night and yeah. we're in a hotel like i don't know how we pull this off and i think at some point we just said fuck it and said okay whatever we green lit the thing and i remember you know we just basically act, you know act one act would go and then, you know, we're eating dessert and then another act would stand up and we would just introduce these folks. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful evening. I'd love to get your recap of it if you can, uh, when I'm done here, but, and then at some point that, you know, these, these nights always go long, right? So it's like 1230 at night, you guys are the, the final act after maybe 10 other acts and we push everybody out onto this balcony. We're in the middle of downtown Seattle at the Sorrento Hotel on this balcony, on the rooftop balcony, rather. Mm -hmm. And you guys do a full plugged in set. And, you know, we're around all these buildings. And not only are, you know, is everything just absolutely cranked, but everyone's windows are open because it's the hottest day of the year <laughs> in, in the history of Seattle. And the cops bum rush the building. We managed to stave them off. You know, we misdirect them because they can't figure out where the hell the mu music is coming from. <laughs> but we got a full recording of, uh, you know, maybe I'll tack the, that 
recording on to the end of this yeah. podcast or something. But um, I'm one. It was an amazing night for us. We we had so much fun, and you can still see these uh, recordings out there on the internet at songsforeatinganddrinking.com. I'm wondering yeah. if uh, if you have uh, a memory, fond or otherwise, of of that evening. Oh, that was a great evening. Uh, I should also point out I played a couple acoustic songs as well that night. You did, which were absolutely stunning, yeah. and they're on that same site as well. Songs for eating, yeah, and, yeah. and that that was fun. Uh, you know, I don't do a lot of solo shows, but uh, I'm glad that one was recorded so well because it, it's pretty pretty great footage of it and it kind of captures a time a very beardy time for me <laughs> i was just gonna say <laughs> it looked a little different yeah um but yeah no, I, I can't believe that we managed to play for as long as we did that night outside of the, <laughs> of the deck i don't remember it being like the hottest day of it the was. year it was a hundred and something degrees that yeah. day and of course that we were in an air-conditioned space but the air condition was trying to support a whole hotel of everyone turning it on full blast was it didn't work all that well and it was everyone's a little shiny yeah at night yeah, sure. <laughs> that night um uh but, but yeah we we you, you pulled it off and nobody got arrested surprisingly i don't know how that happened but yeah i i don't i like i said i know we didn't play a long set but it's true even, even yeah. what we did play I, i'm surprised we got through it <laughs> this was a very beardy beardy moment for you i'm wondering yeah. uh I probably shouldn't play it right now. If I try and play audio through my computer, it's just going to jack it up. So, um, but we'll link that link there in the show notes, your acoustic performance as well, which was, which was beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to shift gears towards advice. You are obviously a seasoned musician, now collector. You're, you're still touring. You've been doing, you know, mud hunting for 35 years You've written a book about it again, Mud Ride, a messy trip through the grunge explosion, which I think is is absolute must read for anyone, any music fan, uh, but certainly people who um, came up through the 90s. It's especially uh, interesting, touching, and there's a bunch of lovely, beautiful stories there. But let's go to advice because you've seen a lot. Yeah. Give, um, give, give give some advice to the people who are out there. Again, our audience identify as creators. You know, if you're going to give them some advice about longevity, about, you know, I, there's already been some nuggets in there about not actually caring and not betting yeah. your future on success or failure or relative yeah. comparing yourself to your peers. But what are some other lessons that you use some takeaways? Well, the first major lesson as far as musicians go, um, if you want to play music, play music with your friends, you know, don't like there, there used to be, you know, the people that wanted to make it big in the music biz, the people that I thought were deluded uh, would put ads in the back of a music magazine or a local magazine, like the rocket, like, you know, seek, you know, vocalist seeking, you know, guitar player and drummer, you know, and so many of them would be like, must have pro looking attitude, you know, no losers, you know, like blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, must have a car. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most of them didn't make it anywhere because uh, they're just trying to build this perfect band. But music is so much about connecting with the people that you're playing with. And if you're already buddies, then you got you're halfway there in my mind, as far as uh, finding some way to communicate with each other. And uh, that's kind of what playing music together is, right? And so, even that transcends music, right? That's could yeah. be true with any creative yeah. act. This is yeah, yeah, I, I would think. And, uh, um, so, I, you know, to me, I maybe I got lucky. Uh, you know, my friends were, you know, as inept as I was when we started playing in bands. And, like, we were inept, me and Mark. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you just kind of grow together. And uh, by the by the time Mud Honey started, uh, Mark and I had already been in three bands together by that point. Unless I'm counting wrong four bands together at that point uh, and uh you know we we communicated pretty well musically and we had a very shared aesthetic i think just from influencing each other for five years at that point and uh that helped a lot and getting matt lucan from the melvins in on bass he was a buddy and we admired you know the melvins that still do gonna see them in a few days here actually um but uh, 
you know, he was a great, he was an obvious person to ask because he'd just been let go from the Melvins. And we're like, well, dude, Lucan's not playing with anybody. Let's get him. <laughs> and like, we were told buddies with him already. So yeah. that made sense. Uh, finding Dan Peters was, I didn't know him that well, but we'd already kind of jammed at a party and it was awesome. Uh, I guess at a basement at a party at Ed Fotheringham's house. And, you know, that he made sense. Like we had a couple ideas for drummers. You know, but they were just people that we knew. And, uh, you know, I think we got lucky with how we put it together, but we all knew each other. And uh, that chemistry, it sounds like that chemistry overrides skill or ambition or anything. Yeah. And you can't always you can't always predict how that's going to go. But, you know, I think we got really lucky and it gelled almost immediately. Honestly, you know, we didn't pay any dues. Uh, We said we were a band and we had two record labels two hot trendy record labels willing to put records out by us sub pop and amphetamine reptile out of minneapolis so you know we 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 got lucky no doubt about that um and we were lucky but there is a certain chemistry that you know you're striving for i think and communication and you know i guess that is number one lesson number As one the band gets a, along a little bit for a little bit longer the lesson we learned uh, was to share songwriting credit. So then there's less ego battles. Uh, some bands can like, like chop that up. Pearl Jam does that. Like, and, uh, but using a very famous example, the Ramones were never the same once they stopped just sharing the songwriters credit. They did that for the first four or five records. And then, then uh, everything went to hell after that. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the two lessons for for music Great. share some writing be friendly be friends <laughs> i think that the, i really believe deeply that that goes that transcends music that's like share the credit you know yeah. wh- whether you're building a company or you know designing a, a book cover as i'm looking at this here it's like sharing the credit um sharing the spotlight there's an underscore of sort of community and this it does it keeps going back i can i continue to like hear your words in my headphones and then go back to sort of the DIY ethos that is, you know, punk music and the, you know, get together with your friends and make art. Sure. Don't be precious when everyone else is judging your art. I think Andy Warhol said, just keep, keep making more art and you don't have to judge it, but let yeah. others do the judging and you do the <laughs> making. Mm-hmm. Um, grateful to have you on the show again, for those out there, mud ride, a messy trip, through the grunge explosion by mr steve turner steve it's been a treat it's been a long time i think we revealed that it's was it a decade i think it's about a decade ago oh god that stinks (laughs) oh that fateful night in seattle (laughs) ladies and gentlemen please welcome steve turner and his bad ideas this is one of the non-food songs it's called the i-5 corridor Stupid car mine broke down again I'm in a beat up borrowed white Chevy minivan It's not us anymore, it's them And wasting time watching wheels spin is not for me I swear to God I'm gonna leave this town and get myself free Straight down the I-5 corridor Straight down the I-5 corridor Straight down the I-5 corridor I burned them off like a fog But it didn't get clear Yes, I regret a few things, my dear I guess I miss her I know I miss the way things used to be But that's long gone in a distant world And the white Chevy minivan is taking me Straight down the I-5 corridor Straight down the I-5 corridor Straight down the I-5 corridor
called I Know You Scorpio. I know you, Scorpio. Yeah, I know you, I do. Been dressing up the Mona Lisa in poetry and pearls like a fool. A statue of a reputation, several shades of nude. Bookshelves of good intentions won't tell me what to do. They seem the memories clear as the colors disappear, and when you wake up, nobody else is here. I know you, Scorpio. Yeah, I know you, I do. You're a sweet talking little mama now, and I love the things you do. You lay me down at night Pick me back up again in the mornings I'm gonna leave you one day, pretty mama Without any warning A bad dream, it's just a bad dream Sometimes the good ones aren't as good as they seem The memory's clear as the colors disappear And when you wake up is here I know you Scorpio I know you Scorpio I know you Scorpio yeah. <laughs> Thanks Thanks for you know spearheading so much as you did in the Seattle music scene. It was transformational for me. Um, I, I remember, you know, early, early Mud Honey just feeling, made me want to do cool shit. That's <laughs> like it really, really, really did. And like, I'll never forget the first few bars of Smells Like Teen Spirit or the first time, you know, seeing you guys live, you guys and others from that era, uh, hey. very, very transformational and inspirational. So thank you for being a thank guest you. on the show. Is there anywhere else you would steer us besides, you know, picking up copies of the book? You guys just finished touring. Did you not? Yeah, we're going to do a U.S. tour in October, like middle of October to the middle of November. Okay. We'll be playing up there. I think at the, the crocodile, the, oh, we're, oh, we're still calling it the moon crocodile. crocodile, but I think we're doing, <laughs> we're doing that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye out for for the tour. And in the meantime, pick up the book. Thanks so much for being on the show, being a guest here, Steve. And uh, from myself and Steve Turner from Mud Honey, uh, to everybody else out there in the world, we hope you have an amazing day. Stay creative. And until next time, we, be we both bid you adieu. Adieu.